This is TWIS. This Week in Science, episode number 647, recorded on Wednesday, November 29th, 2017. Science Brainwash. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to say other things. Hey, everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki. <laughs> and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your heads with an alphabet, worms and rats. But first, TWIS is supported by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Relax. The following hours of programming are intended for a specific audience. You may or may not think yourself to be who we are looking for. And that's all right. Just relax. It isn't you. <laughs> Our target audience is the human brain. And sometimes to get there, to get messages to the human brain, you have to slip them past to the human filters, that bogged down bouncer of enlightened thought. So for the next few hours, relax your senses. Even if you happen to love the content, relax. Even if you happen to be offended by the content, relax. It's all designed to sneak past your ears so that may, we may communicate with your brain directly in a relaxed way. And soon, without even realizing it, your brain will be awash in sciencey goodness with another episode of This Week in Science coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back. Yet again, following a weekend of Thanksgiving goodness, I hope everyone is stuffed to the gills, proverbially, pro proverbia, prover proverbially, or um, I don't know, phy phylogenetically gills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so much wonderful, wonderful, hopefully holiday time for people out there, but it's time to get back to the science. We do love the science here. And on this week's show, the science news I brought includes stories about China's space exploration, an expanded alphabet, and some heart. Hmm. Justin, what did you bring? I've got a mysterious mythological creature, buff ladies of yesterday, and fuzzy, fluffy, feathered dinosaurs. Fuzzy wuzzy hmm. was a... Uh, Archaeopteryx, no. Brontosaurus, no, no. T-Rex. No. No. no, And Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh, I brought some dumb lizards. I brought some hot coffee and I brought some Martian worms. That sounds pretty awesome. I'm looking forward to the animal corner. We've got so many fun things on the show tonight. I am thrilled and ready to jump in. But before we do, I want to remind everyone that you can subscribe to the Twist Podcast on iTunes, the Apple Podcast Player, in the Google Play Podcast Portal, in Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn. We are on YouTube. We're on Facebook. You can search for This Week in Science. T-W-I-S, tw TWIS also. You can go to twist.org. That's our website, and you can find all these wonderful places. But really, just look for us all over the place. This Week in Science, if you want to find us and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Um, and if you do go to the TWIS website, the This Week in Science 2018 Blair's Animal Corner calendars are here. I got them in the mail. And they are looking amazing. These coloring calendars are uh, just, they, they're fabulous. I'm so excited to color this in. My son has already gotten started on the cover yeah. with a toad. Yes, we're doing some good work over here. And um, if you're interested, the, the quality of the paper is very nice. It's matte, but a little bit shiny. So you don't want to use any inks that are going to run and smear, but uh, maybe felt tip pens could work and colored pencils. 
I think colored pencils will be fabulous for this coloring calendar. And additionally, it is the end of November. And as we move into the beginning of the month of December, I want to remind everyone that at the end of this month, our top 11 science stories of 2017 show is going to be upon us. Within weeks, we will be counting down the top 11 science stories of 2017. So if you have ideas about what should be on that list, tell us what you think. Let us know over on Facebook. Wow, I can't even, I can't believe it's already that time of year. It's already here. We got to get ready. Got to start making our list and checking it twice. Got to make sure that science is nice. All right, let's jump into the show. No more business. It's time for the science. Okay, have you guys seen the headlines this last week? There were a bunch of headlines. I think Newsweek started it off from some others basically saying, Dark matter is dead. There's a new mathematical idea that gets rid of dark matter and dark energy. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Mm -hmm. Eh. (laughs) Wrong. Shocking. Yeah. So uh, there is a wonderful write-up about this by Ryan Mandelbaum over on Gizmodo. And he uh, went through and compiled a bunch of writing by various physicists, not just science writers, but physicists on the subject of whether or not dark matter has been deemed dead or not. So the idea came from a paper that was published out of the University of Geneva by a scientist by the name of Andre Mader. And Mater proposed that there is a part of the theory of general relativity that sometimes in big, big voids, areas where there isn't any mass at all, and there's a bunch of those in space, these voids in space, that uh, there are certain aspects of the theory that are wrong. And so he proposed that the mathematics need to be changed. And by changing the math involved in the theory of relativity, get rid of dark matter, which was always a fudge factor anyway, ish, right? We don't, cause we don't really know what it is, except there's a lot of it. Dark matter and dark energy make up sort of like 95% of the known universe and we can't even see it. Anyway, uh, yeah, Mandelbaum says that there was a wonderful press release released by the university and a bunch of places picked it up and never talked to outside sources, physicists, and uh, there's a lot of physicists who say it's, this, is the, the, this is not worth even talking about because the, this new idea by Mater doesn't even have... A, a math, a, a mathematical object to define the theory. It's called a Lagrangian. It doesn't even contain a Lagrangian. And for theoretical physicists, if a paper doesn't contain a Lagrangian, it's just an idea and they're not actually getting at the actual math out of it. And there are no testable predictions in the paper either. So no testable predictions, no actual uh, math defining the problem. And Mater actually goes on at some point to say, yeah, the math is maybe a little underdeveloped. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, snap. (laughs) To to say that in a room full of physicists. Oh, my. (laughs) Underdeveloped. Yeah. Um, So anyway, all these headlines about the death of dark matter, the death has been greatly overstated, me thinks. Um, and uh, so over on Gizmodo, I will put the link on the Twist website if you want to read this article by Ryan Mandelbaum, because it's a it, it has some great links to some other write-ups by physicists, such as Sabine Hossenfelder, who uh, took the paper apart, according to Mandelbaum, on her blog, Back Reactions. And so there's, there's, there are lots of things. It's a great starting point to go investigate. And it's a good, if you're learning about uh, these physics theories and how these ideas work, this is a wonderful teaching moment. You know, why is it that this particular paper doesn't actually call for the death 
of this fairly large idea <laughs> in modern physics. Yes. Uh, moving on from there. Oh, yeah. And by the way, China may have some indirect evidence of dark matter. Oh. Even dark matter's death hmm. is being stated all over the Internet. It's not direct evidence, not actually uh, visualizing dark matter or detecting it directly. But China, in 2015, launched a space probe called the Dark Matter Particle Explorer, or DAMP, with an E at the end. Dampy. Damp. Um, DAMP looks for decay signals, indirect decay signals, of hypothetical dark matter candidates called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. <laughs> you haven't heard of WIMPs before, Blair? You're laughing. I this is a long time. time. It's just all the all the acronyms. They just keep piling them on. I'm sure there's going to be three more. That's what I was laughing about. Damp WIMPs. This is where we're going. Yeah. yeah. So damp is looking for WIMPs. Weekly interacting massive particles. And this satellite was, uh, was launched in 2015, and it has been using its detectors to observe incoming direction, energy, and electric charge of electrons and positrons and other particles that make up cosmic rays. Now, the electrons and the positrons in the antimatter, if they combine, they hit each other, then you're going to have annihilation. And when they these electron-positron pairs annihilate, there are other particles that can be detected. And so if there is dark matter, uh, if there's the are these WIMPs involved in the whole system, the WIMPs could occasionally get involved and there are these electron-positron pairs and then there could be an excess over what is expected of uh, the particles that would come from the cosmic ray particles that would come from things like supernovas or other stellar objects that emit cosmic rays. Well, it's like we kind of have an idea of like, oh, okay, supernova explodes. It was about this big. There's going to be this much release of energy. These kinds of particles are going to be seen. This is the kind of spectra that we expect. And so overlooking at these electron positron pairs, you would, if there's no, if there are no WIMPs involved, you would expect a normal curve, that there's just this regular curve. But because they're looking in this particular way, what they're looking for is a shift from the normal expected smooth curve. And DAMP confirmed an anomalous break in the curve and has published this uh, collaboration between China and uh, various, uh, various other bodies they uh, have basically confirmed that they saw something different. Now, they've only looked at 1.5 million cosmic ray electron positron pairs. So it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a hint that they might be right, that these wimps might be there. But it's not. I mean, in the, term, in, in, in the big scale of observations, this isn't huge for physics. So what they're looking for are more. The researchers say they expected a three-year life for the satellite, but because of the way it's functioning, they're expecting it to last about five years now. And by the end of its life, they expect about 10 billion recorded cosmic ray events, which will be a much larger data set. And if there is some kind of shift or break in the curve as a result of wimps being present and leading to an excess of these electron positron pairs then it'll confirm that their hypotheses are potentially correct and that these are places to look for dark matter hmm. yeah indirect not direct it's just getting and and the researchers say these measurements will inform our understanding of cosmic ray acceleration and will tell us about the physical processes in shocks around supernova and the physics of pulsars. Fun, fun, fun. Um, and then moving on from cosmic rays and dark matter, let's get deep into the cells. Let's do some biology. You guys like biology? I don't know much yeah. about biology. <laughs> You're going to learn a little bit more now. How about synthetic biology? Gonna make my own organisms. 
Yeah. I'm going to give them some new DNA letters in the DNA alphabet. What? Yeah. Yeah. So, or new DNA letters not in the DNA alphabet. You well, think. not normally. Yeah. So we've got guanine, cytosine, adenine, and tyrosine, right? G, C, A, T are the letters that are normally, uh, that normally appear as base pairs in DNA and RNA. Well, except you have uracil in RNA. Um, however, three years ago, researchers Floyd Romsberg from Scripps Research Institute and his colleagues, they reported creating more nucleosides, more nucleotides. So in addition to G, C, A, and T, they created an X and a Y that they could get to pair up inside of DNA. Hmm. But it was just kind of like, oh, we can make it work in a, in a dish, right? We can make it work in a dish. We can't actually make it work in a living organism. And so that's basically what has happened now. And they've reported in nature that they have uh, functionally integrated these new nucleotides, new base pairs, X and Y, that were synthetically, artificially created. They've gotten them to integrate into back to synthetic bacterial DNA into the genomes. And not only that, but gotten the, the genes, the genetic sequences in which they are contained to be transcribed and translated into protein molecules. Now, the protein molecules they've made, that doesn't, they haven't changed a too much of the function or the only slightly changed the structure of them. So what they did is they took a codon with codons are three nucleotides together, like a, uh, in, in these non-critical part of a gene. And so they took a codon T tyrosine, A adenine and C cytosine, the TAC codon, and that encodes an amino acid tyrosine. So each codon set of three nucleotides is code for a nucleotide that can then be, an, or not a nucle an amino acid that can be integrated into a protein. And so what they did is they replaced it, this TAC codon, with their new synthetic codon, AXC. And they created a transfer RNA that had the opposite of that, the anticodon, mm -hmm. which is GYT, so the X, its anticodon is Y, this new anticodon, and that carried an, an, an amino acid called PRK. And this particular amino acid, PRK, is not really usually found in nature. It is a synthetic amino acid, and it was supplied by the researchers. It didn't come from the cells themselves. And so this codon, this anticodon, GYT, was used to add this synthetic amino acid into the protein that was translated and created. And so it, it worked. And they, cre they created green fluorescent proteins that contained this amino acid that isn't normally in there, this non-standard amino acid, a synthetic, that's synthetically created. Um, and since it was in a non-critical part of the gene, it didn't change the gene, right? It didn't change the protein. The protein was still basically the same. It was just proof of process, proof of function. Mm -hmm. This whole thing didn't kill the bacteria. The bacteria are still able to divide and uh, survive and to create these proteins that now contain a synthetic addition from scientists. Okay. And so... Question. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to talk about implications now. Yes, but that's yes. what I wanted to ask is yeah. why on earth would you need new base pairs? So the idea is that you could potentially, with these new base pairs, connect it to a synthetic molecule, a synthetic amino, another synthetic amino acid that actually will change the function of a protein mm. that will lead to protein molecules that have a function that chemists want, that biologists want. 
if and you want to something- add something, like if you want, if you want to enhance the ability of a microbe to break down plastic, can you right. change one of their proteins, one of their enzyme proteins to do that using a system like this? And this is something that would be, that would, this would make it easier than just changing the base pairs that we have. It would, it's adding to uh, our abilities. So okay. Um, okay. yeah, it just adds to potential well, future function that researchers yeah. can add, add to nature. We can stick mm-hmm. a molecule in something. Maybe you just want a, a tracking molecule mm-hmm. to be in a cell. And with these new codons, maybe you can easily integrate this tracking molecule into cells and figure out, you know, what's happening during some metabolic process. Mm-hmm. You know, that's it, one aspect. There's some yeah. sort of like affinity, like G's like C's and, and A's like T's or something of this nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's going on. So, so if you're creating something that, you know, G's, C's, T's, and A's are like, I don't really know what to do with. <laughs> I don't really know what to do with that. Um, but you're entering something else that you do want to interact with at a specific place. Um, and you've created your own X, Y, then maybe you've, maybe you can, maybe you can direct it to that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. There's a, there's a whole, there's yeah. a whole field it's, of being I think able to play with stuff. It's many that, steps uh, back from where my brain can go because right now <laughs> I'm just picturing, okay, we got these new base pairs to do a thing that we can already do. That's great. We got it to function. Right? We got it to go in there as junk DNA and get replicated. And get replicated. Like, kind of, well, and we got it to, to make part. proteins. We got it to make proteins. Yep. So that didn't, really, it didn't, it didn't mess up. The, it, didn't it, didn't, it didn't get rejected. It didn't get rejected. That's exactly it. Yes. But yeah. So now we have to figure out how to use these to make things we couldn't otherwise make. So that's potentially or, yeah. or, 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 or store stop. information. So we've, we've, information. we've oh. recently reported on, you know, a movie being uh, genetic stored in DNA, right? If we're going to be storing information in DNA, I mean, there's a lot of, vari- of, of variables that we have with just four letters. Add mm-hmm. two more, and the, the 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 degrees of freedom that you have for your information storage go up. So, mm-hmm. for, for information storage purposes, it's really this is an interesting, very exciting uh, yes. bit of progress for actually playing with incorporating different amino acids into proteins, seeing if you can give proteins new functions, if you can, what messes up their functions. I mean, it, it, the research aspects are going to be very mm-hmm. fascinating to see where they go. Nice. Very yeah. cool. And the researchers said, uh, the engineers wanted to get molecules that function inside of a cell. And that was our focus before this paper. He said, every protein produced in any living cell has been produced by decoding a four letter alphabet. We have now reported the decoding of proteins with a six letter alphabet. This still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. (laughs) That's thanks. So the researchers are excited about what they're doing. Is well. that is that being excited or being terrified? <laughs> excited, I, th- I mean, yeah. You normally you would think the hair on the back of your neck stopping uh, standing up. That's a fear response, right? Yeah. But maybe it's just excitement. I don't know. I don't know. Ultimate power. <laughs> yes, ultimate power. <laughs> Those synthetic biologists. The future is crazy. <laughs> This is this week in science. Really powerful. It is going to be powerful. Powerful future. Justin, what did you bring? There's a mysterious ape-like creature said to inhabit the high mountains of Nepal and Tibet. Many names, though the ones you're likely most familiar with, (laughs) and the abominable. (laughs) I can never say abominable. Abominable? I can't say that word. (laughs) Abominable. Snowman. You like I'm turned much into, closer. You turned into a member of the Red Hot Chili Peppers when you try to say that word. <laughs> I'm much, I'm much more, I'm much better off just calling it the abdominal snowman. Oh yeah, yeah. Just say <laughs> Yeti. Way Yeti is fine. Just call it a Yeti. Yeti. I'm yes. just calling it Yeti. White Sightings have, have been 
reported for centuries, footprints spotted, stories passed down generation to generation. But could these accounts be wrong? Is it possible that for centuries, these people have been believing the myths and the lore of the Yeti by mistake? No, say the unskeptical, for, for there is physical evidence. Yeti hairs and skin fragments and scat have been found in numerous locations. Evidence in museums and private collections. These samples stand in stark defiance of a world that refuses to believe that a large upright ape-like creature walks amongst the snow leopards and the high frozen peaks of the Himalayas. Evidence that has now been tested by Oh, I wonder how that went. Yeah. And now we have DNA evidence. That. The research project, which will be published in Proceedings of the Royal Society B, analyzed nine Yeti specimens, including bone, tooth, skin, hair, and fecal samples collected in the Himalayas and Tibetan Plateau. Of those, one turned out to be from a dog. Uh-huh. <laughs> However, the other eight, ready? Drum roll. Dun, 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 Steve. From- oh. <laughs> Steve. Who? What? Stephen Accounting. You know, Steve. Stephen Accounting. He's always taking his vacation That's to go right. hike in Himalayas. It's That's all right. Steve. He's a very hairy man. No. <laughs> No, it turns out the all other uh, all the other eight samples that they had were bears. Oh, that's great. Uh, one from an Asian black bear, one from a Himalayan, uh, Himalayan brown bear, and the other six were Tibetan brown bears. Quotey voice of Charlotte Lindquist. Uh, Our findings strongly suggest that the biological underpinnings of the Yeti legend can be found in local bears. And our study demonstrates that genetics should be able to unravel other similar mysteries. Says, again, lead scientist Charlotte Lindquist, PhD, an associate professor of biological sciences at the University at Buffalo College of Arts and Sciences, and now head of the buzzkill department at all Yeti enthusiasts (laughs) uh, society. (laughs) This study represents the most rigorous analysis to date of samples suspected to have derived from Anomalous or mythical hominid-like creatures, says Linquist and co-authors in the new paper. Uh, Linquist says science can be a useful tool in exploring the roots of myths about large, mysterious creatures. She notes that in Africa, long-standing Western legend of an African unicorn was explained in the early 20th century by British researchers who found and described a flesh-and-blood okapi giraffe relative that looks like a mix between that animal and some sort of zebra horse. And in Australia, where people and oversized animals actually probably coexisted for a long time, thousands of years ago, some speculated that references to enormous animal-like creatures in Australia's Aboriginal Dreamtime mythology may have drawn from actual ancient encounters or encounters with fossil records. Uh, which are all over Australia. Linko's work, like the discovery of the Okapi, is direct. Clearly, a big part of the Yeti legend has to do with bears, she says. <laughs> well, think about bear feet, too. Their, their hind feet are actually, their pads are pretty long. So I'm, that's what I've been thinking about, too. And they also have the five toes at the front. So... You could almost see how if you squinted really hard and it was a print in the snow, you could almost think maybe it was humanoid. And a print in the snow, and then you get, you know, a little bit of melting and the thing sort of expands a little bit, you know, it, can, it changes shape a little bit. And you're not, you're not a bear tracker, you're... <laughs> You're a Bigfoot or Yeti hunter. And you're looking for signs yeah. of Yeti. And so you're already coming at it with a bias. Yeah. As yeah. Also, bears to, make really yeah. weird sounds. <sighs> no. No. Uh, the researchers investigated samples such as a scrap of skin from the hand or paw of a Yeti. That was part <laughs> that of was a, monas- a monastic relic. 
<laughs> and a fragment of a femur bone from a decayed Yeti. Found that was not a Yeti. <laughs> yeah. Thing. But uh, and the skin sample, uh, skin sample. Turned out be from, to be from an Asian black bear, and the bone was a Tibetan brown bear. Besides tracing the origins of the Yeti legend, Linguist's work is uncovering information about the evolutionary history of these Asian bears, which is sort of interesting. So they, they could sort of find uh, analysis showed why the Tibetan brown bear shows a close common ancestry with their Northern American and Eurasian kin. Himalayan brown bears belong to a distinct evolutionary lineage that diverged early on from all other brown bears. That's pretty fascinating. That's a split that is thought to have occurred now 650,000 years ago during a, a place of uh, a period of glaciation. So these, these bears, even though they're now sort of seem to be, uh, you know, or, or are habitating, hab <laughs> cohabitating the same sort of regions as the Yeti, themselves were separated uh, for a enormous amount of their evolutionary history. So, Yeti uh, actually lending itself to some scientific research and discovery. So, remember last week Although I talked about that, elusive. that portable <laughs> DNA uh, scanner? So, yes. wouldn't it be cool if I could, well, maybe it would be pretty mean, to take that to the Bigfoot Museum in Santa Cruz that I went to? <laughs> yes. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Let's go. That's very tempting. I want to go to sir, all. I your life go to, is a sham. Yeah, I want to go up and down Route sixty six. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let's stop at all the sideshow places <laughs> with all their claims of aliens and Bigfoot this and everything. The source is clearly made out of plexiglass. Excuse me, I've got my portable DNA scanner here. I'm just gonna take a little sample. Don't mind me. Just be here for about 45 minutes. No worries. This is actually from Cockroach. This one's from a rat. You guys, get more creative. Yeah, I like it. This is a good cross-country yeah, trip. Was a, I like it. Yeah. Didn't we, wasn't there, didn't we have some sort of similar revelation? There was like a, a Bigfoot sample that turned out to be a combination of raccoon and bear or something of this nature. Mm -hmm. This was a while ago. Some some yep. some Bigfoot carcass that was kept in the freezer, but then mysteriously disappeared. But then they still had some of the hair sample, and it was yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <sighs> All righty. Well, the story might be a buzzkill for some, but as you said, Justin, it is also giving us scientific information about the distribution yeah. of those bears, which is yeah, there you go. Which, those are, like you said, there's actually science that can maybe be applied to conservation efforts and other wildlife management efforts in these areas. This yeah. is great. But now we've talked about not real organisms in the Himalayas. Let's talk about some real organisms in Blair's <laughs> Animal Corner. It's that time again. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a She can't play. I'm so excited to bring you a story about Mars. I don't often talk about space in the animal corner. Wait, wait, we're talking. Right. How does Mars making it to the animal corner? This is yeah. fascinating. There's, there's no animals on Mars, as far as Squirrels we're aware. On Mars. Well, a, um, well, a recent well, study from Wageningen University in the Netherlands uh, was looking at Mars soil simulants from NASA. And these Mars soil simulants are where it all starts. They have these experiments that they do on these soil simulants to try to figure out how a person could actually live on Mars. In order to live on Mars, you can't just make potatoes out of your human poop like in The Martian. It's a little what? more complicated than that. So what they do is they actually take some soil from a volcano in Hawaii that's supposed to stand for Mars soil and a desert in Arizona that's supposed to be simulant 
moon soil. And experiments starting all the way back in 2013 have looked at how to grow crops in these odd soils. They've been able to grow over a dozen different types of crops at this point. The only species they have been in, unsuccessful in raising in these Martian soils is actually spinach. <laughs> but crops such as green beans, peas, radish, tomato, potato, rugula, carrot, garden cress, all seem possible. And then they regularly analyze them for heavy metals so that they know if they're actually edible and alkaloids. And then actually pretty recently, after th they passed some of these tests, they had a dinner on the har with the harvest's crops for... Um, for some people who helped crowdfund this research, which is pretty funny. But now to the animals. You can't have a successful agricultural system without some animals, namely worms. Right. Worms, worms. are very oh, important yeah. for soil ecology. Mm -hmm. Yes, Farmers they are the middleman between the, everywhere where there's farms. Yeah. So they're the middleman between poo and bacteria. The, the bacteria cannot do the nitrogen fixation, processing phosphorus, potassium. They can't do all of that from the fertilizer without the worm as the middleman. So the worm breaks it down into smaller bits that are easily consumed or transported or changed by the bacteria. They do that. The other really big thing that they do, which is a problem with Martian and Moonian is that the lunar so soil? <laughs> Moonian. Moonian. <laughs> lunar soil. I, think I that's made up a, a cult. Word. <laughs> yeah. So Martian and lunar soil, um, it doesn't move water well because it's it's almost they describe it almost as being glass like or um or very slick. So it's very difficult for water to move properly through the soil. And worms aerate. They create these kind of channels that bring water through the soil in all different directions. So worms are really essential to a successful agricultural system. So what they did is they took these experiments that they were trying to grow these crops. They added organic matter, which in this case was simulated poo and pee from human Martians, which in this case is actually pig slurry, Mm, those are fun two words, pig slurry. Um, so they add that and then they have started to try to add in adult worms. Well, a surprise came this week in the Netherlands. They found two baby worms. <gasps> oh, little baby worms. Two yes. baby worms. They only added adult worms, which Earth's means. First Martians. First Simulated Martian worms. The first first generation. Yeah, there's worms having having sex in simulated Martian soil. Yes. This is great yes. news. This means if this soil can support worms, it is much more likely to be able to support plant life. Mm -hmm. So but so that but the, the but this is this is soil from uh, Hawaii and Arizona. Yes. This is not soil from Mars. Correct. So it's still Earth soil. Correct. <laughs> it is a Mars soil simulant. Right. So it is supposed to be matching in consistency, um, com composition, all these sorts of things to the samples yeah. that they have analyzed on Mars. So it's all theoretical at this point. But right, so until far, we do a return mission and come back yes. with some Martian dirt. That's right. No, no, no. So, We've got to do this the other way. We have to send, send, the, the, send the worms no, to Mars. No, panspermia yet. We're not ready yet. <laughs> panwormia. Panwormia, exactly. Yeah. Panwormia. But We're actually, this brings, up, this brings up an incredibly important point, which is long before mankind colonizes Mars, we need to send we need to send the bottom of the food chain or the food cycle as far down as we can go. We're going to need to send microbes and worms and pollinating insects and all these. Sort of, we need to get things started before we get there. And so, and so we should also think of this in case we ever worry about earth getting invaded by aliens. 
it's probably going to have to happen the same way. We're going to probably start to see what is that strange insect that nobody's ever seen before, and its DNA is so unlike anything else on this planet. Oh, it has an like, X and a Y. Mm-hmm. There's, There's a problem, though, Justin. What's that? And that is what worms eat. Yes. They eat poop of vertebrates. Yes. But so we'll send so how do you send worms to Mars without a food source? Well, well, we have to. We'll have to just like just like people. We would have to send, you know, them with supplies. Right. So you're going to send wormy care package. This care package of of pig slurry and Mm -hmm. let them get stuck. Yeah, I don't know. Without a steady, without a steady supply of poop, I don't know if worms could survive without us. That's. It's a potential snag. I'm not saying it's insurmountable, but you got to think poop if you're thinking worms. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> anyway. Oh, oh, and speaking of, I know this is jumping into the animal corner, but speaking That's of funny. foreign life forms, there's a story going around that Russian cosmonauts found bacteria on the International Space Station that <sighs> didn't come from Earth and that there's like bacteria that somehow landed on the space station from space. But mm, no, you, no, you guys, no. Just, they checked it. They checked it just like the Yeti and it's baloney. From bears, which it's is also bears. fascinating. How bears do they? <laughs> from bears. <laughs> You know what kind of bears? bears Tardigrades. Are... Water bears. Water bears. Water bears. Yeah. I don't know. No, uh, but really, it's 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 contamination. It's mm-hmm. bacteria from people, or it's also somebody touched a thing. Somebody <laughs> touched a thing, and we know that clean rooms are actually not one hundred percent clean. Yeah, that bacteria can grow in these places, and so it's very possible that this was a this this is human error, people. Mm-hmm. Human error. So Absolutely. yeah, no, yeah. There's no well, space bacteria on the ISS. <laughs> well, but there might be worms in space soon. We'll see. That's right. We'll figure it out. Moving on to our problems at home. Uh, bearded dragons, a very popular pet, a native to Australia, and recent studies have shown pretty smart. Bearded dragons are able to note behavior of peers and copy it if there is some sort of reward. And that means that they are pretty good animals to test in terms of individual intelligence amongst a group. So you can kind of see how a dragon reacts in response to seeing somebody else do something good. So despite most people thinking them as just kind of a a pretty pet, they're actually a pretty good study species for intelligence. A recent study from the University of Lincoln in the UK found evidence that climate change could affect bearded dragon intelligence. Hmm. Now, Mm. I'll, I'll say right now, disclaimer, 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 this is a pretty small sample size of a study. They had 13 eggs, They put seven in a warmer than normal 30 degrees Celsius nest and six in a normal 27 degrees Celsius nest. After they hatched and grew up, they then tested the intelligence of these lizards. They did that by showing them a video, showing a bearded dragon, opening a sliding door, and then testing them to see if they could or would imitate the behavior to get to a reward. And this is something where... Prior research showed with the intelligence that opening a screen door is something lizards don't know to do on their own, but they do learn to do it by watching other lizards opening a screen. So this is a good test method. And they found that fewer of the lizards that incubated in the warmer pens were able to mimic the lizard in the video than those incubated at normal temperatures. And those that did at the higher temperatures did it at a much slower pace. It took them much longer to figure it out. They also note that this is similar to research done by Jonathan Webb, which found that exposing geckos to warmer temperatures in the nest made them duller and less likely to survive. So we know that temperature is a stressor. We know that a change in temperature on a reptile is going to be a stressor for a bunch of reasons. They're ectothermic, they're cold-blooded, so their behavior is affected by temperature outside. But the other big thing is the nest temperature. And we know with some animals like 
crocodilians and turtles and tortoises that the temperature of a nest can actually dictate what sex the babies come out as. Um, whether they're males or females, it actually depends on the nest temperature. So that can be a big problem as climate change approaches. But this is a whole nother element that there's some sort of taxing being done to these embryos as they grow. I don't know if it's too hot. And so there's other processes going on in the egg to keep them from dying, essentially, as it gets too hot, that they're they're allocating I would assume energy away from developing the brain. That would be my hypothesis if this is all shaking out to be true. Um, but I definitely think we this requires a lot more study in this species and other reptile species to really see exactly what's going on. But it's a pretty interesting initial test on that. So warm temperatures, the warmer it gets, the dumber the lizards are going to get. That would appear to be the case. Yeah. There he goes. He's opened his little sliding door. That's unfortunate. These poor lizards, they won't be able to problem solve and find themselves food and then they'll yeah. starve. And then because they're starving, then we won't have more lizards and mm -hmm. then we will run out of lizards. Yes. So <laughs> lizards are important for a lot of reasons. It depends on what they eat, but a lot of lizards eat pest species, mice, rats, snails, slugs, other bugs. So Lizards are actually really important to habitats. Um, I mean, no surprise. I always say that all species are important because they are. But um, <laughs> it's definitely reptiles are going to be hit pretty hard by climate change, whether it be, you know, sex dependent, um, temperature dependent sex determination, whether it be mm -hmm. behavioral changes or whether it be them just moving to follow temperatures that they're used to. And changing their ecosystems. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be a pretty interesting quick change because since they can't regulate their own body temperature they have to do something it's pretty interesting well i i for one don't want to see a bunch of dumb lizards populating the world so let's fix this yes reduce your greenhouse <laughs> gas emissions save the lizard brains keep the lizards smart yes yeah all right, everybody, this is This Week in Science. We are going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in just a few moments with lots more stories. I got a little heart coming for you, and I think Justin's got some feathers. Heart and feathers. There you go. It's coming up. Stay tuned. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening or for watching. We really appreciate you being a part of the Twist Minion family. Thanks for being part of what we do. Thanks for paying attention. Thanks for being curious and wanting to know more about the world of science. This Week in Science is listener supported. And so I have a whole bunch of things to tell you about right now along those lines. Right now, we have calendars. Dun, dun, dun. New calendars. They are here. We've been asking you to pre-order forever. But no longer is pre-ordering what you need to do. Now you just need to order because they're here. And it's 12 months of artistic animal goodness from Blair, who put a lot of effort into creating these beautiful images that you get to color. This is a coloring calendar just for you. The paper is thick and nice. It's a great quality calendar. Um, the images are nice dark lines that allow you a lot of space to put your colors in and to see the pictures in illuminated in the light that you would like to see. A water bear. Look, we were just talking about tardigrades. Yes. Not only is there great art every single month that you get to be a part of lovingly, painstakingly <laughs> coloring in, but there's also every month you have information about uh, when Twist is broadcasting and also other interesting sciencey and geeky holidays throughout the month. I mean, did you know that there's an International Beaver Day, International Cuckoo Day, World Day for Laboratory Animals? Bat Appreciation Day. I mean, all these things are in the month of April alone, and that's not even the full list. This calendar is available now at the Twist website. So if you go to twist.org, 
get your hands on this thing. Make your order now. The time is right for the holidays. Could be a great gift to someone you know, someone you love, or just to yourself. And um, yeah, get ready for 2018. Make some plans with Twist. Go to twist.org to get your calendar right now. If you head over to twist.org, you will also see, in addition to the link for purchasing the coloring calendar, we also have our Zazzle store up in the header bar. So you can click on that Zazzle store and that'll take you to the place that we have all of our logo and Blair's Animal Corner products available for you currently. And they're having a big sale right now. They're from 20 to 50% off different items. But these items, you can get the Twist logo on a t-shirt. We've also got a nice polo shirt. There are beautiful artistic lumbar pillows. Who doesn't want a woolly mammoth lumbar pillow? I mean, seriously, there's wrapping paper. Do you need, seriously, This Week in Science wrapping paper for your Christmas presents. This is something you need, you guys. And a portion of the proceeds does go back to support Twists to help us out and to help us keep doing what we do. So you can get to this store just by clicking on the Zazzle store link at twist.org. Another way that you can help us out in this holiday season is to donate directly to Twist. You can do that by clicking on the donate button that's on the sidebar of our main page, twist.org. Click on it. It takes you to a PayPal interface that will make that a nice, easy uh, experience for you. And then you can also click on our Patreon link. Click on that Patreon link. It takes you to patreon.com slash this week in science where you can pledge to support us in an ongoing fashion week after week, episode after episode, and get some nice gifts in return for your sponsorship. All of these things we could really use your help with. So head to twist.org, click on the link of your choice, Find a way to help Twist out and keep Twist going into the new year. Uh, at at least at this level, I mean, if you if you're able to help us more, maybe we'll be able to do more. That's what we'd like to do: more, more, more science for you. And if you are feeling pressured by all these cyber days and giving days and black days and everything, right? This last week, it's been like a super shopping week. Don't feel pressured. Don't feel pressured. You don't need to buy anything if you don't if you don't want to. That's okay. Can you just at least help us out by telling somebody about Twist? Share Twist today. Get somebody subscribed to the Twist podcast. That would be a huge way to help us out this holiday season. Thank you so much for all of your support. We really could not do this without you. And we're back with more this week in science. Oh, yes, we are. And one of my favorite times of the show is right now. Let's talk about what has science done for me lately? lately. <laughs> we ask people every week to write in and let us know how science is impacting their lives. And we have a letter this week from Minion Matt. Vandenanden. I did not pronounce that very well, Matt. Vandenanden from Ohio. And he wrote in with a wonderful list of what science has done for him lately. He says, he's sorry if this is long. He got a bit carried away. Oh, good. Go for which it. We love. Thank you for getting carried away about science. He says, like many others who have answered this question for you, I am truly thankful for medical advances and new technologies. But my real answer to this question is a bit different. You see, for the past 20 years, I've taught science to the very young. 10 years at a science museum and 10 years as a preschool teacher. My daily interaction with science isn't at all high tech. He's put too many lima beans into cups cups of dirt to count. I never tell my students what's going to happen, and they're always amazed. We bring our trowels outside, and almost every day we dig for worms. Last week, a four-year-old asked why we weren't finding many, and I got to talk about the changing seasons and how different animals deal with the cold weather. We mix blue water and yellow water, and <gasps> holy crap, we get green. <laughs> 
<laughs> we have pet Madagascar hissing cockroaches. And even though other people don't like them, we know a lot about them. So we're not scared or grossed out. Last week, a little girl asked me what happened if you put spaghetti in the freezer? I loved it. That's a great question. Let's try it and find out. Nice. My cr- yeah, my crowning achievement as a preschool science teacher was when, with a lot of parental help, I guided a group of five-year-olds in dissecting cow eyeballs. Oh, wow. For me, science isn't facts and figures and new discoveries. For me, science is showing very young people that the world is jam-packed with secrets and mysteries, that we can ask questions, and that we can find the answers. So what has science done for me lately? It has given me the joy and privilege of helping children discover awe and wonder for the world around them. Fantastic. And, and I will, I will, uh, I will d- find a point to disagree uh, with you, Matt, in that you, your, your, your inter- interaction with science is all about new discoveries. They may not be new to science, but they're new to all of your students. And that's what yeah. must make it just ever so riveting. Um, we've done a few of those experiments here at this house, in fact. Although, not, not no cow, cow eyes. We don't have cow eyes. And the spaghetti nope. in the freezer is something now I'm going to have to just do. What happens to spaghetti in the freezer? What happens? I've never done it. I can't believe I've never tried that. I'm going to have to find out. <laughs> so many fun things. Yeah, ask a question. Oh my gosh, is there a way I can find out the answer? If kids are taught from a young age that they can try things. It's a wonderful, it's just a wonderful tool to give them going into life for new discoveries forever and ever. Matt, thank you so much for your story, your list of things. It's, I, I, I'm inspired by what you do with those kids. And so that's, that's just, that's just wonderful. Everyone, we need you to write in and let us know what science has done for you lately. What does it do for you every day? Come on, give me a list. Give me one item. I don't care. I want to hear it from you. So write in on our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash this week in science. Right, go look for this week in science on Facebook. Send us a message. Send me a message. We will read it on the air. I want to know and I want to share it with everyone out there. Let's inspire each other and let's continue to do it every week. All right, everybody. And um, was there something else that I wanted to say? But is it, did I have another thing? Oh, yeah. And I'm going to remind you again. Top 11 science stories of 2018 is coming at the end of the month. So while you're there at Facebook telling me what science has done for you lately, maybe also let me know what science stories from this last year you thought were amazing and should be on our top 11 list. Sound good? Good. Sounds great. Yeah. Justin, tell me a story. Okay. Researchers from the University of Cambridge's Department of Archaeology just completed a study comparing the bones of Central European women that lived during the first 6,000 years of farming with those of modern athletes on campus. Turns out the average prehistoric agricultural woman was way buffer. They had stronger upper arms than the living female rowing champions on campus. Physical prowess was likely obtained through tilling soil and harvesting crops by hand, as well as the grinding of grain for as much as five hours a day just to make the flour. Until now, bioarchaeological investigations of past behavior have interpreted women's bones Solely through direct comparison to those of men. Men. Hmm. However, turns out male bones respond to strain and stress dramatic way than female bones, leading perhaps some to incorrectly uh, believe that females had it a little easier in the farming ancient timey days. Cambridge scientists say that this has resulted in a systematic underestimation Underestimation of the nature and scale of the physical demands borne by women in prehistory. Quotey voice. This is the first study to actually compare prehistoric female bones to those of living women. Wilson McIntosh, lead author of the study, 
published in the journal Science Advances. By interpreting women's bones in a female-specific context, we can start to see how intensive, variable, and laborious their behaviors were, hinting at a hidden history of women's work over thousands of years. Uh, the study used a CT scanner to analyze the arm and leg bones of living women who are runners, rowers, as well as those who live more sedentary lifestyles. Uh, this is a more quotey voice. It can be easy to forget that the bone is a living tissue when it responds to the rigors we put our bodies through. Physical impact and muscle activity both put strain on bone, calling called loading. Mm hmm Bone reacts by changing in shape, curvature, thickness, and density over time to accommodate the repeated strain. So basically, so basically they did they find that the the shoulder or the arm bones were were bigger? The bones were bigger than than women today? Yeah, that uh, they showed they showed the, the brunt of the stresses as well as being having more. They can sort of uh, rebuild the muscle tissue based on the the changes in the bone, and mm -hmm. and found that the, the women likely had much larger upper body, arm, and shoulder strength. Right. Uh, it says by analyzing bone characteristics, living people whose regular physical exertion is known, and comparing them to characteristics of ancient bones, we can start to interpret the kind of labor the ancestors were performing in prehistory. So, yeah, they looked at uh, they looked at a bunch of of rowers at the Cambridge University Women's Boat Club, who actually won the big boat race and broke a record in doing so. Uh, the Neolithic women analyzed from the study. This would have been seventy four hundred to or seven thousand to seventy four hundred years ago. Had similar leg bone strength to that of the modern rowers but their arms were 11 to 16% stronger for their size than the rowers and almost 30% stronger than a typical female Cambridge student. So these women would have won arm wrestling competitions. Oh yeah. <laughs> easily. Uh, they also looked at some bronze age women, 3,500 to 4,300 years old who had, Nine to thirteen percent stronger arm bones than the rowers, but twelve percent weaker leg bones. Interesting. Yeah. So a possible explanation they put forth for this fierce arm strength uh, is the grinding of grain, but they can't really specifically say what feature was causing the bone loading that they found. Fascinating. Yeah. So these women, they were active participants in the manual labor oh, of their of their social groups, wherever they lived. They weren't just carrying the babies around. No, that wasn't no. their job. Uh, that wasn't their only job. And yeah, they were uh, buff. Macintosh continues, prior to the invention of the plow, subsistence farming involved manually planting, tilling, harvesting the crops. Women were also likely to have been fetching food and water for the domestic livestock, processing milk and meat, converting hides and wool into textiles. Uh, don't know what the men were doing, but the women seemed to be doing a whole lot of work. I don't know what was left for the men to do. Maybe, maybe we were in, you know, cooking in the kitchen. Who knows? What, right. What tasks yes. were left. Just, just out, quote unquote, hunting all day. Mm -hmm. I'm hunting. <laughs> That's what we called it. We'll be back so, in a few hours. Oh, yeah. couldn't, couldn't catch anything today. Sorry, sweetie. Oh, you made bread. <laughs> wow. Oh, How did you do that? That's fascinating. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And thus began the fable of the little red hen, in which the little <laughs> red hen says, I grew the wheat, I ground the wheat, I threshed the wheat, I made the bread, and you never helped. So I'm going to eat the wheat, eat the bread all by myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. little red hen. <laughs> so, so it's sort of interesting, too, because then you have to take into account the, the, the downscaling of, of labor on women over, over thousands of years as well, mm -hmm. right? Like from this yeah. intensive labor environment to... A lot of the technologies from, you know, 
from creating a plow that's pulled by oxen to grinding wheels to all these things, it seemed like more and more it was like a lot of the technology that came about was alleviating the labor of women. And men too, to some, to, to a degree, but it changed the, it probably changed the societal pressures yeah. for sure. Yeah. And allowed a, a shift in the roles that they, that each, that each gender plays um, in the, in the society. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Shifting gender roles. Thanks to plows and metal work in the metal shifting gender roles. And I wonder what it would take. What would it take for, I mean, rowers of today, they work out and they like, they've got some serious upper body strength. So what would right. it take to actually get the muscle mass that these Bronze Age and Iron Age women had? Yeah, no, it would be I mean, quite intensive. Yeah, quite that's intensive. A, I mean, there's, intense there's, there's, work. Uh, shoot, I'm going to mess it up. It's um, Swedish or Norwegian, I want to say. But there's this, there's this ancient site where there was a lot of, of early salt and uh, salt mining taking place. And, and the men there all had kind of short legs and pretty strong upper bodies because they spent all their time in these caves like taking salt out of these, these mines. And the women all had, had, had a sort of scoliosis and a, <laughs> like a, a, a one-sided strong muscle and one-sided sort of weak side. And it's thought that they were the ones who were carrying salt from oh, taking like bags or they, yeah they were like yeah, over bags. one shoulder yeah. and like carrying like but this was you know and these things when you think about them these are happening for generations these aren't just like oh you spent the summer you know grinding flour or or wheat this or is what i can blame it's, if, if, if this is like a, a scandinavian thing oh, that yeah. was going that i'm going to blame my scoliosis <laughs> on the generations of salt mining <laughs> all of scoliosis might come from scandinavian salt mining like anyway scoliosis right. see if you can trace your roots <laughs> back to some sort of scandinavian heritage that's right the salt mines yeah. Okay. Well, other things that are strong are heart muscle. It's not just ancient female arms, but our hearts beat our entire lives. Except every once in a while they get messed up and you have a heart attack and there's maybe some damage to your heart. And that area of the heart does not grow back. It forms a scar. And that area then doesn't doesn't help the pumping action so the pumping strength of your heart is then diminished and wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually transplant new muscle tissue mm. into your heart to be able to fix that scar tissue to be able to fix the damage I love it. That would be great, Kiki, but obviously that's beyond our ability to do. <laughs> no, not necessarily. One day, my nope. Huh? nope, nope. One day means, oh, right about now. Um, <laughs> I don't know if these, these, these it, it has not been shown that they can, that this can be actually put into hearts yet, but this is the step. This is the next step. So researchers have taken induced pluripotent stem cells. These are biomedical engineers at Duke University, and they published in Nature Communications this last week. And uh, their research takes these induced pluripotent stem cells to create a big patch of heart muscle. They've been able to take, they've been able to take these patches that could be implanted into the dead muscle, potentially. The pat patches act like normal heart muscle. They conduct electrical activity, electrical signals. They contract, they secrete enzymes and growth fa factors uh, that could help with damaged tissue in the heart that hasn't even died yet. But the big thing is getting patches of heart muscle that are big enough to be actually applied to the damaged human heart. 
And to date, nobody has been able to create a heart patch large enough, which out with, uh, it, it just hasn't worked. And so they say creating individual cardiac muscle cells now is pretty commonplace, but people have been focused on growing miniature tissues for drug development. Scaling it up to this size is something that's never been done and it required a lot of engineering ingenuity. They used all sorts of stem cells, including cells derived from embryos and other ones that were actually like skin cells that were forced or induced into their pluripotent state. And they were able to create cardiomyocytes, which are those cells that are responsible for muscle contraction, fibroblasts that are like the structural material, uh, endothelial and smooth muscle cells that form the blood vessels. And they placed them all these cells, they took them and they put them into the uh, into a substrate, a, what they call a jelly-like substance, and at the right ratios. And the cells all self-organized. The cells talked to each other and self-organized to create a working system of muscle cells, blood vessels, and uh, and, and and structural cells. Nice. Functional, fully functional patch. Uh, one of the researchers says, it turns out that rocking the samples to bathe and splash them to improve nutrient delivery is extremely important. We obtained three to five times better results with rocking the cultures. They, they rock their cultures. Rock by heart muscle. Yes. Um, so anyway, they have been able to create patches up to 16 square centimeters, which is pretty big. And there are several, several cells thick. So it's not just a single cell layer. It's multiple cells working together. And yes, the idea next is to be able to, uh, to actually work in a human heart. They have shown that these patches survive, get vascularization, get blood vessels, and maintain the function that they had in the dish when they are implanted into mice and rat hearts. So a person that would need this, would they be essentially on the way out or would they still have decent heart function, but things are going to be difficult for them? Yeah, you would think somebody, it would be, uh, they'd have decent heart function, okay. but it's less. Right. Right. Um, I mean, maybe when this is first instituted, because it'll be experimental at the very, you know, when they first start using these things, um, that it will be people where it's like, okay, this is kind of their heart. They, they, there's too much damage and we really need to replace this for their hearts to continue to work. Um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe so is that, that is it, this, this might be a, a, a step you take instead of like attempting to do a heart replacement. kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, instead of putting in a pacemaker, instead of doing a heart right. replacement, maybe you can just replace the dead tissue. Yeah. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. And could you imagine, I mean, the induced pluripotent stem cell, um, if you can take a person's skin, take a skin sample, use the stem cells for, and t or turn those into these induced pluripotent stem cells turn them into heart, these heart cells, you're not going to have to deal with uh, rejection issues because it's your own cells. And I so cannot you, wait. The yeah. The timing is amazing. Yeah. Until that's all it takes is you just have, you're going to have a bandaid on from them taking a skin sample from you and you'll get your organ function back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the big, the big question now, I mean, even though it's several cells thick, Heart muscle in humans is a lot thicker than that. So it does need to have more vascularization. It does need to have, uh, it, it, it needs to be thicker. They need to be able to do that, but maybe it's more rocking, right, Blair? More rocking, more rocking. I like my heart muscle rocked, not stirred. <laughs> uh, exactly. Uh. Uh, yeah, so maybe one day a patch for broken hearts. Got another story, Justin? Oh. Uh, why, of course. I believe you said something about fluffy dinosaurs, and I want to hear about them. Fluffy? <laughs> what? 
University of Bristol led study revealed new details about dinosaur feathers. Uh, so we have birds which are descended from feathered dinosaurs. Uh, one of the most famous is, of course, the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. Ah, one that went around and ate the most people. Mm-hmm. Clever girl. <laughs> Researchers examined high resolution, uh, high resolution, exceptionally perver- preserved fossils of a crow sized Paravian dinosaur named Anchorinus. Anchor. Anchorinus. <laughs> Anchorinus. Anchorinus? Anchorinus? Anchorinus. The feathers found around the body of the Anchorinus, known as contour feathers, revealed an extinct primitive feather form consisting of short quill with long, independent, flexible barbs erupting from the quill at low angles to form two veins and a forked feathered shape. So not your your modern bird with its single row of feathers. These are lots of sort of fuzzy bits coming off that aren't, aren't like, aren't quite quill like Uh, the observations were observations were made possible by decay processes that separated some of these feathers from the body prior to burial and fossilization, making the structures of these individual little feathers between the feathers easier to interpret, more visible. These feathers would have given Anchorinus a fluffy appearance relative to the streamlined bodies of modern flying birds whose feathers have tightly zipped veins forming continuous surfaces. Anchorinus unzipped feathers might have affected the animal's ability to control its temperature and repel water, possibly being less effective than a modern bird feather. The shaggy plumage would also have increased drag when Anchorinus glided. Additionally, the feathers on the wing lacked the aerodynamic asymmetrical quality of modern flight feathers. This would have hindered the feathers' ability to form a lift surface. So, to compensate, paravins like Anchorinus packed multiple rows of long feathers into the, into the wing, unlike modern birds, where it was just that single row. Also, they have basically four wings. Uh, They have long feathers, not just on the arms, but on the legs as well. Right. And elongated feathers forming on the fringe around the tail. This increased surface area likely allowed gliding long before the evolution of powered flight. Uh, What's also interesting out of all this, previous depictions of paravins perching on tree limbs is out. As well-developed arms and claws were much better suited for climbing. So this is this is a a climbing dinosaur looking fuzzy creature that could probably glide from limb to limb, but likely wasn't doing a bunch of flapping. And it had g- grasping claws. Yeah, those grasping claws, which uh which aren't aren't going to be so uh, perchy. They're not. They're not really designed for perching. Those are those are climbers. All right. So this guy, four limbed dinosaur, modified for climbing, gliding, and staying warm with its nice fur coat. Yeah, four winged and toothy. They still had teeth. Toothy. They hadn't lost their toothy, teeth. Toothy, clawed. Climbing the trees, you do not want this gliding down Fuzzy, from the treetops to jump on your head. No. Cute, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How can big we bring was that one back? Or... If we get enough DNA, can we bring that one back, Blair? Maybe. How big was he? It's raven size. Raven? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Done. Maybe, oh. maybe it was like the dinosaur version of the sloth. Like super slow? Super slow with its little claws. <laughs> and it used its gliding feathers for when it fell out of the tree. It was like, oh, I guess I should glide down. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That was just like a parachute, right? It was just, just like for- a parachute. Yeah. Emergencies well, only. It's just like, ah, I'm falling. Ah, slow it down. There we go. <laughs> That's great. That's totally possible. Heck yeah. Let's bring one back and find out. Let's find I out. I mean, sure, I give up. 
<laughs> no more fighting. No more fighting. <laughs> Justin's going to take a win on that one. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Another way to take a win is, oh, don't give these muscles to the, to the robots. When the robots come to take over the, the world as they will someday, don't give these new muscles to the robots. Researchers have created new artificial muscles that can be used in all sorts of uh, applications, potentially. Um, and this way that they have uh, done it is they were inspired by origami. Inspired by origami, they have created flexible muscles. They don't, they're not as rigid as designs have been before, and they can be designed and fabricated, manufactured at a low cost, and very easily, and it is, they've created this fluid-filled artificial muscle that has, uh, can be programmed for multiple degrees of freedom in its movement, and that is actually potentially stronger than natural muscle in the way that it works. They did, they have done tests on this origami folded material. It's a fluid filled design. Um, these fluid filled muscles actually produce greater contractile strength in some instances than natural muscle cells. Origami, origami. So, sure. <laughs> so, so is this going to be like some sort of running shoe knee brace combination that I can put on and run like 30 miles an hour. Right. So maybe this is the kind of thing that's going to be integrated into the next um, big Nike Michael Jordan shoe. <laughs> it actually makes you leap like five feet in the air. Yeah. Um, but the, they are talking about potentially uh, integrating this into exoskeleton designs to help make you stronger. Um, these are biocompatible materials. And so these could be used for medical applications, wearable applications. Superhero uh, suits. That's super, what it is. This is yeah. it. Superhero suits. Everybody can be a superhero with super strength now, leaping abilities and all kinds of stuff. Oh, here it is. And so they have, uh, they have an example of um, turning the vacuum system on for this, uh, this artificial muscle, and it can lift a car tire off the ground. Car tires are not light, very strong. I'm not that heavy either, but how big, how much material are they using? I can't see in this. Uh... Yeah, not too much material. Yeah. Not too much. Um, but it can be 3D printed and folded and created fairly easily. And it is a zigzag origami structure um, that maybe allows the folding plates and the way that it stretches and works maybe gives it part of its strength. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty interesting stuff. So when the robots come, hopefully they will not have this nice origami muscle. No, now we can all have it too. Mm -hmm. Now we can have it to help us play ping pong. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or battle robots. Or battle the robots, that's or right. Or arm, will... arm wrestle prehistoric women. <laughs> <laughs> or try to wrestle all those, uh, those dinosaurs we let loose back in. <laughs> yeah, try to just catch them again. I need to put on my I need to put on my origami exoskeleton so that I can catch my dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Hey Blair, yeah, there's a there's a hole on our paraavian net, and um, I don't see a lot of them. Okay, I'm let me suit up real quick. I'm gonna suit up. Uh, um, two. Let's get into the quick stories at the end of the show. I've got two kind of fun quick stories, according to a new study uh, that has come out on the genetics of New York City rats. New York City rats. There's like gentrified rats. There's uptown rats, and there's downtown rats, midtown rats. Really? The rats across town from each other in New York City are not related. Wow. I thought they rode the subway. 
<laughs> they do, they do. But um, a researcher named Matthew Combs, has, he's a graduate student at Fordham University, and he has been trapping and sequencing the DNA from brown rats that live in Manhattan to put together a genetic profile of the population of rats in the city. And they all have a pretty homogenous origin that basically these rats they came from Western Europe. They probably came in about the 18th century when uh, New York was a British colony. They came in from Great Britain, from France on ships. And since then, these- They came with the Irish. Yeah, and that's, and that's who they are. They're not a diverse, they're not, a, maybe with the Irish, right? During the potato famine, who knows? Um, but the, these rats, they have a homogenous beginning and they are not uh, a diversified population. These Western European rats have, they have held onto their territory and, and not crossbred a lot. So even further from that though, the populations from different areas of town have diverged from each other. Even though they all come from that similar Western European rat stock, uptown rats and downtown rats are separated by Midtown. Hmm. And so the Midtown area, you know what's going on there? It's a commercial district. And so there's no, um, no trash from people's garbage. Not, it, there's not a lot of houses there or backyards where rats get. So there's no food or shelter in this commercial wow. area. And rats don't move very far in their lives. They only need a couple of blocks to live in. And so they just don't mix the uptown rats and the downtown rats. They're like, we don't know each other. Yeah. There's this, uh, there's this buffer of no, no resources. So why go that direction from, oh. from either perspective? Yeah. Just to think, you know, 10,000 years from now, they could be separate species. They could be exactly. If they continue along this, along this trajectory, it's very possible they could completely diverge because of this geographical barrier of Midtown in New York City. Um, and the researcher Combs told The Atlantic, uh, he said, if you gave us a rat, we could tell whether it came from the West Village or the East Village even. They're actually unique little rat neighborhoods. Wow. And the boundaries of the neighborhoods kind of fit with the human neighborhoods. So they actually can drill it down to the distinctive nature of rat neighborhoods in New York City. But the big difference is uptown and downtown. There are neighborhood differences, but uptown, uptown rat, always given. No. <laughs> I can but, stop, but stop right now. But there's, but there's, I also kind of wonder like if there's, going to be like an overlaying also like the economics of any given neighborhood uh right like, how much garbage is there do they have good garbage uh pickup or bad garbage pickup because and how there's... aggressive is the extermination efforts in a given neighborhood like all of these things are going to mm -hmm. be kind of interesting to, to, to layer on but uh yeah, yeah. and have uh, affected yeah, they've affected the population dynamics of the rat, the brown rat in New York City. Who knew? Such Man, a diverse it's city. It's, it's largely walkable, too, which is, you know, kind of amazing that these, these rats aren't more homogenous than they are. Yeah. Um, something that's not homogenous are musical tastes. And we do know that one uh, ex-host of This Week in Science, one of his favorite bands was Rush. Who was Ted, that? Ted Dunning. He always Ted used liked to. Rush? Ted, I know he. I know he liked Rush. No, <laughs> no that's not true. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I was trying to use I don't it think as. It is. I think it is. Maybe I'm thinking. I'm think, so. okay, sure. Anywho, Canadian researchers looking at some new bacteria that they came across. Uh, these microbes uh, have. Lots of flagella around their outer membranes. So they look kind of hairy and furry and long haired. And a postdoc in this University of British Columbia microbiology lab 
was looking for some good Canadian music and a senior author on the paper that came out, Patrick Keelan, he suggested that this post, this postdoc listen to Rush. And then this postdoc came back and said, those microbes we're finding have long hair like the guys on the album 2112. <laughs> so now... Great. These little microbes, not only do they have flagella, flow, long flowing flagellal hair, they also have rhythm and they bob and sway to whatever the fluid is that surrounds them. <laughs> yes, and so this new species, Pseudotrichonympha, Pseudotrichonympha has been, uh, has been named as Pseudotrichonympha lii, Pseudotrichonympha lifesoni, and Pseudotrichonympha pirti, after the musicians Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, and Neil Peart, Pert, Pert, Peart, Perti, Neil Pert. Um, so anyway, yeah, Canadian Rush band Rush, they do have some sciencey songs, Natural Science, Tom Sawyer, Closer to the Heart, right? Themes from science. And literature. Sure. Yeah. And the j- microbe that's named after uh, Pert, the drummer and lyricist, uh, has a special intracellular structure that has been never before seen in any bacteria. They have called it the rotatosome. The rotatosome. And they have no idea what it does. It rotates. It rotates. It spins and rotates inside the bacteria, and they don't know what it does. <laughs> anyway, yeah. sorry everyone on headphones about that. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible thing to do to people. <laughs> what a rush. Uh, Blair, uh, you yes, well, I know that uh, the show might be coming to an end. Some people might be feeling a little sleepy or some people might have a lot of work ahead of themselves and they might be chugging the coffee. I love my coffee. Well, coffee is one of those things that might be in trouble due to that jerk climate change. <laughs> climate change climate change take my coffee that's the last straw so the problem with coffee and climate change is that coffee originally grew in dense forests in between these tall trees but the coffee plant now in most of the places where it's grown in um, brazil vietnam colombia indonesia this coffee has been planted in areas where they clear cut first so that they can maximize their space for the coffee plant. The problem is that the coffee plant's actually getting sunburned, essentially. They're in too much sun. And as the temperatures rise, they're seeing a depletion in their yield in coffee. With global warming, coffee production in Brazil will be dramatically reduced by perhaps 70% if it continues to be grown in full sun, says Dr. Benoit Bertrand, coffee expert at CIRAD. Um, that is a uh, coffee uh, kind of organization in terms of the coffee growing and the coffee research and the future of coffee. There's all sorts of regulations on that, turns out. And so uh, with this potential loss in coffee yields because of full sun, the best option is actually to grow crops in the shades of taller trees like they used to grow in timber, fruit trees, in agroforestry systems. And it's really good for maintaining biodiversity. It's good for soil. It's good for um, for minerals in the soil. It's good to produce prevent erosion. It actually reduces on pesticides and irrigation. So there is a lot to be gained by doing agroforestry. The main problem is that productivity is about 30% lower because you have space being taken up by trees that are not being taken up by coffee plants. So in the short term, it's easy for people to see that and go, mm, I don't want to lose that 30% yield. But this new study is very clearly saying a loss of 30% now saves 70% later. So this is um, a beneficial agricultural method for all of these different reasons that now will be potentially 
a necessity to keep our coffee production up. So prices will go up in the short term, but it'll benefit everything in the long term because we won't lose as much coffee production overall if they make the shift. Right. Plus, if in the long term people need less fertilizers, less pesticides, less um, man hours to keep all of these things healthy, that could in the long term result in a in a lower price in the end as well. So short term, long term thing with climate change rearing its ugly head, we have to start looking long term on agriculture. So there is a solution here. I'd say this is a very good result of this study. We have a solution that is a win, 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 win. The one loss is that you will end up paying a little bit more for your coffee, Mm. but it'll be there. Be there. I don't want to lose my coffee, so I'll take it. I'll take it. We need to start looking at these compensatory mechanisms that we can put in place for to fight against potential future losses. Absolutely. Yeah. We got to work as a team, people. Gotta- Let's be a team to get ourselves coffee. If we can't work as a team for the coffee, what chance do we really have? Oh, man. We got to be a team. I need my three to four cups of coffee a day. Me too. <laughs> It's good for my brain. (laughs) Makes me happy. It'll help me live longer. Come on, you guys want me to live longer? Let's change this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Any more stories, Justin? No, I'm good. You're good. (laughs) You are good. You're great. Everyone out there, I would love to say we have reached the end of another show. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. Everyone out there in the chat rooms, Hey. <laughs> hey. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for for chatting and being a part of the conversation today. And I hope that you are here again next week to Fada, Brandon and Identity 4. Thank you so much for your assistance on a weekly basis. So it, it you help keep this show going. Thank you. And now it is time for me to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to a honey moss, Aaron Luthen, Adam Mishkan, Alec Doty, Alex Wisson, Andy Gro, Arlene Moss, Artyom, Ben Rothick, Bill Kersey, Bob Calder, Braxton Howard, Brendan Minish, Brian Hedrick, Brian Condren, Brian Hone, Bruce Cordell, Byron Lee, Charlene Hedry, Christopher Dreyer, Christopher Rapp, and Colombo Ahmed, Craig Porter, Dale Bryant, Dana Pearson, Daniel Garcia, Darwin Hannon, Daryl, Dave Neighbor, Dave Wilkinson, David, David Friedel, David Simmerly, David Wiley, Donald Trump, the dubious, Dougal Campbell, E.O., Edward Dyer, Emma Grenier, Eric Knapp, Eric Wolf, Felix Alvarez, Flying Out, Gary S., Gerald Sorrells, G. Burton Lattimore, Oak Gerald Ornyago, Greg Guthman, Greg Riley, Haroon Sarang, Hexator, Howard Tan, Aluma Lama, Jacqueline Boyster, Jake Jones, James, James Dobson, James Randall, Jason Dozier, Jason Olds, Jason Roberts, Jason Schneiderman, Jean Tellier, Jim Drapod, Joe Wheeler, John Atwood, John Crocker, John Gridley, John Ratnaswamy, Keith Corsell, Ken Hayes, Kevin Parachan, Kevin Railsback, Senia Bokova, Kurt Larson, Larry Garcia, Layla Louis Smith, Mar- Mark Mazaros, Marjorie Mark, Mar- Marshall Clark, Matt Sutter, Matthew Litwin, Mitch Neves, More Cowbell, Mountain Sloth, Nathan Greco, Orly Radio, Patrick Cohn, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Phil Nadeau, Philip Shane, Randy Mazuka, Richard Hendricks, Richard Onimus, Richard Porter, Rick Ramos, Robert Aston, Rodney Rui, Garcia, Salgid Sam, Shu Wattis, Sir Frank Adelic, Stefan Insom, Steve DeBell, Steve Lessman, Steve Mashinsky, The Harden Family, Todd Northcutt, Tony Steele, Tyler Harrison, Tyrone Fong, Trainer 84, and Ulysses Adkins. Thank you for all of your support. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can find information at twist.org or you can go directly to patreon.com slash this week in science. And you can help us out also just by telling people about twists, get someone to subscribe. What a great holiday present on next week's show. We will be back in the beginning of December for another episode live online Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Pacific time at twist.org slash live. You can watch live and join our chat room there. But don't worry if you can't make it because all this stuff is recorded for posterity and you can find it at twist.org slash YouTube. You can also sometimes find it at facebook.com slash this week in science and audio episodes are just at twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. You can Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, and we should pop right up. Or if you have a mobile-type device, you can look for the Twist number four droid app in the Android Marketplace or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple Marketplace. 
For more information on anything you heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line. Or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes during the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show... Remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of Toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science science, science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science This week in science This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.